Hey folks, and welcome to our presentation titled Basic Needs Security and Institutional Response. I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves and then I'll provide a little bit of history and context about how this presentation came to be today. Hi everybody, my name is Jenny Barron. I use she, her pronouns and I serve as the Assistant Director of Student Case Management and Referral Coordination. Hi everybody, my name is Michael Buttram. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am working in the Office for Student Leadership, Involvement and Community Engagement, otherwise known as SLICE, and I am the Ramsgans Hunger Program Coordinator. Hello everybody, um, my name is Shay Lenz, she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I do a few different things with case management, both as an administrator and um, I'm also completing my internship for my uh, Master of Social Work. And my name is Lindsay Mason. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the director of off-campus life. The four of us, we've been meeting together uh, initially informally, but um, lately more formally as a basic needs working group on campus. And it was during a meeting that we had back in January or February, where we were meeting with um, institutions across the state uh, of higher education, as well as nonprofits in the state of Colorado, talking about basic needs and financial security, uh, particularly of students on a college campus. And it was during that meeting that we were brainstorming um, as a small group around uh, what, what are we already doing on campus? What more can we do, et cetera? And this idea of a campus-wide training came up. And so what we are excited to showcase for you today is our uh, draft presentation that come spring, we want to launch campus wide for all faculty and staff members to be able to participate in. Our hope today is um, to, to provide um, some education, but also really to get feedback, both about this PowerPoint, what more um, can we be doing in this PowerPoint or what's missing, what questions do you have, et cetera. And then also, if you have feedback around what partnerships are we missing on campus, what more can we be doing for students to help support them in their basic needs security. So I'm um, so again, so we're excited to, for this to be our, our first draft of this presentation, but um, our hope is it to get some significant feedback. So when we launch in the spring, this is an even more robust uh, educational opportunity. So what are basic needs? Um, for the purposes of this uh, presentation, we are going to focus primarily on food and housing. We will touch on transportation, health, and connection. So th those might be areas that we do some expansion into later. But for right now, our focus is on food and housing. Um, was this still me? I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, so, so why are we here? We're here because this conversation is really important. Um, it was necessary before the COVID-19 pandemic. And since then, the impact is, has only been um, amplified. Um, it's, this is an, a necessary conversation and we're here to share what supports we're currently offering. Um, we view this as a related issue to access. You know, um, if we're admitting students in need and don't address those needs, are we really providing access to those students? So uh, as we all know, based on this uh, quote, our students could be just one small crisis away from being insecure in a lot of different areas in their lives. So we wanna try and um, anticipate some of those issues. Getting into here a few of the definitions we're going to be talking about at this during this presentation to kind of um, put us all on the same page with the language that we're using. Food insecurity as defined by the USDA is limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods or limited and uncertain ability to acquire acceptable foods in a socially acceptable way. Um, the USDA has been doing this work on identifying food insecurity for some time. They've come up with a survey that is kind of the standard uh, that allows us to all use apples to apples comparisons when we're talking about food insecurity. They've identified levels being very low up through high level food insecurity. Two of those definitions are 
offered as examples here, low food insecurity, reduced quality, variety or desirability of diet, little or no, little or no indication of reduced food intake, food intake, excuse me, would be low food insecurity, for example. That goes from, again, very low food insecurity all the way through high food insecurity. And for defining housing insecurity, there is not a universal definition um, that is used either by different organizations or different assessment purposes. What we really want to highlight, though, is that housing insecurity does not mean that a student is just experiencing homelessness. Housing insecurity really runs a gamut, and it could include students who uh, currently are in an apartment or in a house, but are having difficulty paying their rent, difficulty paying utilities. Um, their rental rate is so um, high or cost burdensome that they're having difficulty affording healthy food. Um, and then, and then it can also include other things like a student that's couch surfing or living in their car or a student that is experiencing homelessness. But know that housing insecurity is not just one clear definition. Um, it, it really includes students that are just having difficulty affording housing all the way to students that are experiencing homelessness. Before we move on, I'd quickly say that we want to acknowledge that oftentimes these are going to run in tandem. So as we're discussing this, when we're talking about food insecurity, we're often talking about the same student who's experiencing housing insecurity and vice versa. Great. So looking at kind of the individual impact of some of these um, insecurities, especially, you know, we are at a university. So as it relates to um, academic success and academic um, progress, you know, in terms of the GPA, we see diminished GPA or um, um, diminished retention and persistence. So the idea that maybe because of your basic needs aren't being met, you're not able to continue um, with your education. Uh, same goes with graduation rates. And then also just looking at the health and wellness of an individual. So um, what is, we're at, students are at a generally a very um, formative time in their life when they're coming to university. Um, they're kind of learning how to survive maybe on their own for the first time. So what are they learning about themselves and their belief in themselves, how they can meet those basic needs. And then what is the impact on maybe their mental health um, or even their physical health, obviously, as they um, are kind of prioritizing that over maybe their schoolwork. We were able to look at some recent um, reports of, um, from the study on collegiate financial wellness. This is a multi-institutional study that's administered by The Ohio State University, and we are one of the institutions that participates in this. Our most recent data comes from spring 2020, and out of that data, we were able to see that 40% of the respondents said that financial concerns have caused them to neglect their, neglect their academic work. 33% had said that financial concerns caused them to reduce their class load. And almost 40% said that financial concerns caused them to consider dropping out of college. So this is just some specific um, data that we were able to pull out that ties in um, to the slide that Shay was just talking about that uh, students that are experiencing financial insecurity, it absolutely impacts their ability to be academically successful. When we look at some of this data and we recognize um, the impact that it's having, we have to recognize that our principles of community call us into action in this moment. Um, to do anything otherwise would run in direct contradiction to who we are as a university. So we've kind of examined those impacts at the individual level. I'd like to zoom out at the societal. Like I'm saying, it's um, as an institution, we've accepted that obligation to work towards social justice, to serve our community in an inclusive fashion. So to let basic needs go unmet is in direct contradiction to those principles. If we are who we say we are, if RAMs really do take care of RAMs, then no student should have to forego their basic needs at the expense of an education. And that is where we feel this conversation is brought to the line. So certainly building off what Mike just said um, in terms of especially our commitment to social justice as an institution, um, we're looking at also how food security, security in general, but security in general, but for here um, specifically food 
and how that really is an issue of social justice. It's not something that exists in a silo. So um, we've kind of looked at the definitions from the USDA, but I kind of like to discuss a little bit more of the actual root of this insecurity, which um, is essentially the inequitable distribution of resources and uneven relationships of power. Um, we recognize that these inequities don't exist in silos, like I said, but they're really representative of the relationships, especially right now, I think it's important to highlight between whiteness and power and how that is really dominant um, in our societal and government, governmental systems and structures in the US. Um, like I said, the Black Lives Matter movement is clearly highlighting some of these systemic disparities right now in real time, but it's also really important to recognize that this is not a new concept. Um, so I also think it's important to recognize that this is barely, very, barely scratching the surface of this type of scholarship. Um, I would be really remiss not to mention the work of some food scholars, specifically um, Josh Sabika, who we have here on campus. Um, he's been really instrumental or his work was very instrumental in my understanding of this topic and how it relates to a larger social movement. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and that um, a lot of the basic ideas that I have on the right-hand side of the slide are, um, just some of the main kind of ideas that I pulled forth from my understanding. So that being structural racism, classism, uh, land rights and sovereignty. Um, I think it's really important that we mention um, that these are inseparable from the historical traumas that a lot of populations have experienced in the US, including colonization, uh, forced relocation from their land, from land, so that to land that's incapable of providing basic sustenance. Um, so, you know, how that can create um, systems of dependency and oppression. And also not to mention the traumas associated with slavery, sharecropping, gentrification, forced segregation, um, all for the black community. It can't go without saying. Um, so food justice is really not obscure. It hits, hits close to home. I think especially now, Jenny had mentioned how it is really just one step away for a lot of people. And um, we see it every day, we see it now. We can't discuss it without looking at um, the workers who are stocking your super, supermarket shelves right now, risking their lives. And especially also another example that hit close to home, I think for us is um, some of the um, issues with labor and um, distribution in the meat packing, specifically in Greeley happening right now and really disproportionately affecting our Latinx community. So um, like I said, a very brief overview of something much more nuanced, but um, it can't, we can't have this discussion with, without talking about some of this. So let's take a quick look at the numbers and see that what, what portion of the population we're talking about it. Um, so first, Let's zoom out to the national level. Uh, the best numbers, the best data that we can gather at this time comes from the Government Accountability Office's recent food insecurity report, which was published in December of 2018. There's some more recent data that's coming from the Hope Center for Community College and Justice, which is at Temple University. And that's a basic needs survey, which has been being produced each year. Um, so we're drawing a little bit from that. The good thing is we are participating with the Hope Center for Community College and Justice uh, for last year as well as this year in their hashtag real college survey, which assesses um, basic needs uh, at the institutional level. Um, so we're, we're taking part in this, which allows us again that kind of apples to apples comparison with other institutions of equal size and, and other sizes. So first, nationwide. Um, Data, of course, varies, but and it's going to show a wide discrepancy, but between 20 and 45 percent of college students experience food insecurity, as defined by the USDA definition, which I offered earlier. What are the reasons behind this? Um, we know the cost of college is rising. Job market and societal pressures are demanding a college degree, so more and more students are entering the college um, population. But the traditional college student is no longer traditional. We often think of that historical picture of a young 18 year old who's stepping onto the college campus, often with mom and dad paying a large portion of that bill. That's no longer the case. Um, half of college students are financially independent. 
the average age of a college student nowadays nationally is 26. Um, 64% are working part-time with 25% working full-time and 22% of college children nationwide have children. So that, uh, that old image is no longer holding true um, when we look at the national statistics. What do we know about the, our own CSU community? Um, and again, we're pulling from a couple of surveys, one produced by ASCSU some time ago, and an, another more recent from that hashtag real college survey. Food insecurity is affecting about 30% of our students. The most recent um, hashtag real college survey was at about 32% of our students. Again, we utilize that USDA survey so that we know we're talking about um, the same type of, of um, apples to apples comparison. What we also know is that women, racially minoritized, first gen students are much more likely to be represent over representation um, in those categories at the facing food insecurity. When we're looking at who are we serving from the staff and faculty, we have state classified and adjunct faculty and international and visiting faculty much more highly represented in the staff category. <clears throat> Michael spoke a little bit about this hashtag real college assessment. And as he mentioned, we are um, able to participate at an institutional level so that we can look at the data specific to our students. The most recent survey data we have is from 2019, but we are currently in the midst of collecting data right now for this survey. So uh, we will have some updated information here soon. But based on the 2019 survey results, here at CSU, 32% of respondents had experienced food insecurity in the prior 30 days. 42% had experienced housing insecurity in the previous year, and 20% of respondents had experienced homelessness in the previous year. And overall, almost 60% of our students here at CSU had experienced at least one form of these basic needs insecurity in the past year. So an, an overwhelming number for sure. The, um, I mentioned this uh, study earlier, this study on collegiate financial wellness that comes out of The Ohio State University. This survey also told us from spring 2020 that almost 80% of the respondents here at CSU agreed or strongly agreed that they felt stressed about their personal finances in general. Almost half of them um, said that they were worried about being able to pay their current monthly expenses. And over 60% of them said they worried about having enough money to pay for school. We also have some data from the National College Health Assessment. This is an assessment that's put out by the American College Health Association and they have recently added in questions around um, food insecurity in particular. We, our most recent data is coming from fall 2019 and what we pulled out of this survey was that food, food insecurity is significantly higher for marginalized populations. When you read this data, you'll see that of all the students who responded and identified as Latinx, 63% of them identified as having low or very low food security. And that's based off the USDA uh, definition of food security that we mentioned in the beginning. 60% of students who identified as Black or African American identified as being low or very low food secure. Same for over 50% of American Indian or Native Alaskan students. Almost 50% of students that identified as LGBTQ identify as low or very low food secure. Almost 60% um, of first generation college students identified as low or very low food secure. And over half of our students living off campus identified similarly. So Rams Against Hunger is trying to respond to these numbers. Um, since 2017, we've been operating a monthly mobile food pantry. This is in collaboration with our partners, the Food Bank for, of Larimer County, um, and they have been critical to our success in being able to do this. During those first few years, we saw numbers jump up exponentially. We started out with around 300 for the first six months or so. Before we transitioned over to a post-COVID world, um, we were running mobile pantries for about eight to 900 people per month. 
From July 19 to March 2020, we saw 3,086 unique visitors or individuals, excuse me, not unique visitors. Um, the visit, visitation, of course, to reinforce those numbers, which Lindsay was just mentioning, show a, a strong overrepresentation among first gen Pell Grant recipients and racially minoritized students. 80% um, of the visitation is students, with a, a nearly 20 being comprised of mostly hourly staff and some staff and some faculty as well, especially visiting faculty. Um, when COVID hit, we recognized we had one on-campus pantry offering and over 1,200 people showed up that day. We ran out of food when we hit about number 900. We recognized at that point and received support from administration to convert to a permanent pantry. And we've been operating since that time, since April 23rd at three days a week out of the LSC theater. We typically see around 350 people, members of our, RAM, of our RAM community coming in each week. Certain weeks we'll really bump those numbers up when we uh, have a special offering. Um, and what we're seeing from our data is that visitors average around two visits per month. We have, in a, to complement that, um, we're running a meal swipe program. This meal swipe program has been in operation since fall of 2015. Dr. Jen Johnson got this along with many of the other Rams Against Hunger programs off the ground. Um, it's working in conjunction with Housing and Dining and the Development Office. The Development Office runs a campaign with us, brings in substantial amount of funding. That funding then goes towards the purchase of swipes from housing and dining at a, uh, a rack rate. Um, and then we allocate those swipes based upon a few uh, criteria. During AY 2020, we saw 442 students served by the program. Um, the average EFC for a swipe program recipient was 2,900. So that's far below Pell eligibility. Um, nine in 10 applicants are off campus. Seven in 10 identify as racially minoritized. Um, and in fall of 2019, we used over 10,000 meals for that program. A little anecdotal, anecdotal um, evidence, the program participants often describe their financial situations as having to prioritize income on paying tuition, rent, and bills first, um, and food and housing insecurity sadly takes a back seat to that. So you've heard a little about what CSU does to support basic needs. We're going to take a deeper dive and we're going to use a framework in which to view these items. This is a framework that is provided out of research from Humboldt State University and shows these three necessary prongs to approach effectively meeting a student's basic needs. Um, so first we'll start on fostering intentional partnerships and outreach to on-campus programs and offices where students regularly seek support. So um, why is this important? Again, we've, we've already kind of highlighted the disparities in, in basic needs, um, but we need to um, address that there's a lack of awareness and there's a stigma associated sometimes with these things. Um, the foster, we need to foster a more appropriate and student-centered referrals. Um, and increase that sense of community and establish um, a, a regular institutional response to this stuff. Um, we do have some important partnerships in place already with the United Way, the Financial Aid Office, um, Energy Outreach Colorado, with the Food Bank of Larimer County, with Hunger Free Colorado, RDEC Food Security Programs, the NAPI Project, Support the Girls, and many, many more. Um, and if you have recommendations, we'd sure like to hear from you. Hope to unmute myself. So um, just looking at a very broad overview of some of the basics and um, how they're broken up, at, as we mentioned in the beginning, um, by food, housing, transportation, health, and connection. So I feel like we've been pretty thorough about the food aside from the SNAP outreach, which we will um, also look into in a little bit. Um, but also just to know that these are the resources or these are the places that you can reach out to if you're just not quite sure, or you need to give um, a warm or student-centered um, referral to somebody. 
um, just reaching out to those of us who do work in case management and off-campus life and um, Rams Against Hunger. I think I'm speaking for all of us here in that, um, you know, we want to see these students connected in the appropriate way. So um, if you don't know, ask and um, just use this as a little bit of a guide. Um, so like I said, um, SNAP for RAM or SNAP, we haven't quite touched on yet. This is actually really exciting um, for us, I, I think. Um, uh, basically what we're doing is trying to bring SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is a federal, federally, uh, federal entitlement program. We're trying to bring that to campus and normalize it um, and make students um, recognize that they don't have to be hungry, that there are some options out there outside of campus. So a lot of times there's a, some myths around SNAP. I think um, people hear SNAP or food stamps and automatically maybe have some negative and unfair connotations, um, but students can be eligible. A lot of students that are eligible have no idea. As you can see, 57% of students at risk and eligible for SNAP don't collect those benefits. So we're really trying to hit that gap. Um, you can, by participating in SNAP, you're not taking away anything from anyone else. The more individuals that are signed up or um, enrolled for the state is actually good for the state in terms of funding. So um, we really encourage students, you're not taking it away from someone else who needs it more. And honestly, um, there is no struggle hierarchy here. So if you need it, um, it's yours to have. And then also that it is convenient and discreet in terms of um, it being a debit card. So no longer are you getting stamps in the mail, um, you'll get sent a debit card that you can swipe just like you would any other one, up to $204 a month actually, that allocation just changed, um, bumped up about 10 bucks, which is cool. So in terms of accessing that at a C at, as a CSU community member, um, you can definitely reach out to us at snap for rams at colostate.edu. That's through the Student Case Management Office. Um, there's also a really great opportunity to sign up in person at the Rams Against Hunger Food Pantries that Mike has been um, talking about. We have an affiliate with the Food Bank for Larimer County who's joined us, which is very exciting. And she's there um, at almost all the pantries to assist students and kind of be um, a forward facing person there as well. So we're hoping that all of these initiatives are going to bring students in. There are some student eligibility standards. I, we won't get into that here now, but if a student needs it, um, refer us to us and, and we can get through some of those more nuanced um, questions. So I'm going to run through a quick overview of the remainder of the Rams Against Hunger um, food services or um, food security services. And what I want to stress is that this issue has many faces and there are students facing a, a whole gamut of food security issues. Um, what we're trying to do is respond in ways with a number of programs that meet that variety of needs. Um, so let me go through each just uh, quickly to kind of let you know what's, what's available to, to students and staff and faculty for that matter. <clears throat> so first, the Meal Swipe program, as I'd mentioned earlier, it started in 2015. The eligibility requirements are simple. They have to have an EFC of 10,000 or less based on the FAFSA or the CSU asset. Um, and I will say that that number is offered and we see a little bit of gray area when we're talking to individual students when I'm viewing the EFCs and assessing their situation. So if a student has an EFC of 12,000, I would still encourage them to apply. Um, you can't have a meal plan in the dining halls. So anybody who works with the dining halls who has an individual meal plan, that's not going to, to work for them to apply for the, for the meal swipes. And they have to be an undergraduate student enrolled in six or more credits. Um, we've had over 800 applicants this past year. Um, we, we accommodate around 300, 350 um, per semester. It is supported fully by a development office campaign, as I had mentioned. So that number will always depend on how much money we've raised. 
there's a little nice student component to where in a typical year, in a non-COVID year, we're able to run something called the Student Day of Giving, where students can donate two of their unused guest swipes to support the program. So that adds, adds a little bit of that awareness building piece and also helps us to offset the number of meals that we need for the students who are on the wait list. The food pantry. The food pantry, as I'd mentioned, has turned into a full-time operation. We're operating three days a week. Those are our hours. We're out of the Lori Student Center Theater. So students can access that, staff and faculty can access that. And for that matter, we would never turn anybody away. So if somebody comes for a box, regardless of who they are, whether they have a, a RAM card or not, or if they're alumni, um, we are happy to serve them. So please, please send us those students if you recognize any signs of food insecurity and please help us to advertise the, the opportunity. A student is gonna walk away or an, a client is gonna walk away with about 25, 30 pounds of fresh fruit and produce, um, shelf stable foods, sometimes some frozen foods, often working with some local restaurants to provide pre-made meals. So um, it's about a week's worth of groceries. I just also would like to add here that um, I, I know Mike mentioned it, but I think the Rams Against Hunger food pantry is just um, maybe the, the option that is the least restrictive for people. So, you know, there can be some eligibility standards with SNAP. Um, there can be some eligibility standards, which we heard about with meal swipe. So this one is really just all encompassing, which I think is just incredibly important. Thank you, Shay. That's that's a great point. And as Shay had mentioned, we do have the SNAP of it, the SNAP benefit specialist there in person, ready to walk a person through the um, initial points of the application and get them on track for 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 getting those eligibility um, requirements met. Pocket pantries. This is much more relevant in a non-COVID year. We still do have three spaces open out of the eight that we typically open. Those are at the ASCSU. Um, little lobby area off the plaza side. There's one at Aggie Family Village in the International Wing, and there's one at University Apartments. Um, these are more grab and go style options. Uh, you're gonna be able to just pick up something on the go. The intention is that students are on the run. They don't often have time or money to allocate towards this purchase of a meal on campus. Um, and when a student is stressed and doesn't have the ability to meet their, their food needs, um, we know that their academic performance is gonna suffer as well. So this the intention here is just to allow students to have something to grab and they know they can get by during the day. So moving on to housing. Um, through the Student Case Management Office, we are um, partnering with utilities within the city of Fort Collins um, to provide some additional help with utility costs. Um, there are two programs there that we're um, able to help students navigate. One is the LEAP program, which is an ongoing um, reduced cost for utilities. And then the other is through the Energy Outreach Colorado. And it's more of a crisis sort of um, behind in my bill and I need some help um, kind of support. So. Um, those two are available through the um, Student Case Management Office, as well as Emergency Rental Assistance, which is coming through um, Case Management, Off-Campus Life, and the Office of Financial Aid. Um, um, but these, there's housing vouchers and rental assistance that comes from the state and federal programs, and these offices can help students to connect to those resources and hopefully get some of those things in place that will help them to be successful over the long haul. I'm gonna let Lindsay take the last half of this slide. The staff in Student Case Management and Off-Campus Life, we also offer one-on-one -on -one appointments to help students understand how to navigate these housing security resources. We have some of these resources offered here through our colleagues at CSU, but we also have many in the local community that we can help our students navigate and access. So we can help them understand and give a referral out to Neighbor to Neighbor, um, which is a local nonprofit organization that helps people with a variety um, of housing security uh, concerns. I can refer out and, and help them access City of Fort Collins Social Sustainability Services, help them understand how to access free laundry services, and many more. These are just a few examples, um, but we know it can be helpful for folks to sit down one-on-one -on -one and um, understand how to access these different resources.
So now we're going to move into some specific recommendations that we have for folks um, that aren't necessarily working with basic needs um, every day, so like faculty and other staff at CSU. Okay, so I think a common, the starving student narrative is very common. Um, I think it's that understanding that when you go to college or the idea, I guess, that when you go to college, you're going to be um, sustaining yourself on ramen and, and that that's normal and okay. Um, and I think what we really need to move away from this starving student narrative as normal um, and move more into the idea that um, it's like we said, it may happen to everyone. It's probably more common on our campus, uh, seeing the numbers than maybe some of us would have thought. Um, and that, and that I guess also for me, what's important here is to have students recognize that um, hopefully there's people at the university who can assist them in um, normalizing their struggle and also um, moving past it and past this idea that this is what maybe you signed up for as a college student. Jenny mentioned earlier that there is research coming out of Humboldt State University around the different prongs um, to use to approach, uh, or excuse me, to approach uh, basic needs and security on your campus. And the, the second prong is training faculty and staff to identify and respond and refer students to appropriate point of contact. So we have some students that are um, accessing our offices um, through off-campus live student case management or talking to Mike and Slice around Rams Against Hunger. But we have many students that are dealing with basic needs and security and, they're, and they don't know to come to us or they're not interacting with us regularly. And so putting this training presentation out, you know, I, I mentioned in the beginning, we're excited, but this is also a pretty hard presentation for us to know that we need to put together. But our hope is that as we um, expand this presentation to be available to all faculty and staff on campus, that faculty and staff will understand, um, we'll, we'll get to in a second here, how to recognize signs of basic insecurity, uh, basic needs insecurity, and understand there are places to refer students to. So if you are interacting with a student and you believe that they could benefit from some basic need support, know that you can send them to student case management or to off-campus life or to SLICE um, to get uh, connected to Mike with Rams Against Hunger. All of us are trained to help refer them to some other resources. So know that any one of us um, would be an appropriate place to refer a student to if you're concerned about their basic needs and security. <laughs> So this does feed a bit into what I had spoke to before with the starving student narrative. Um, but just some of those things that you that we kind of overhear sometimes and think maybe um, gloss over. So Lindsay mentioned some of them with housing and security, but really like the couch, it's not just homelessness, it's couch surfing, it's sleeping in your car, it's um, moving very frequent, frequently from place to place. Um, it's a limited access to showers and bathrooms and that sort of thing. Um, and also just how students are skipping and cutting to um, save money on meals. Like Mike had mentioned, a lot of times meals and basic needs come last, maybe because um, you have that tuition bill that's due and you can just push off the food one day. Um, or that's at least what students are being forced to do. Um, so, really, in the classroom, I mean, faculty are often the people that are going to be the first to hear a student struggle because it can come down to academics and that at that point they just really do have to disclose what's going on. Um, so sometimes you can notice it in the sudden lack of engagement, you know, the students that are really um, have been really engaged, have been really on it, have been asking a lot of questions and then maybe just drop off the radar or they start missing classes and telling you it's because they have to work, which is, or they have childcare or they have transportation, all of these things that um, are, are real life things that can get in the way of academics. Um, and then again, just skimming on what you need to pay for your schooling, um, both physical and mental health and, um, you know, just, the, just your physical appearance and affect can also just change um, as you, are kind of trying to prioritize your basic needs. Um, so one of the things that 
came out of some of the research we've been doing and what is a, a simple thing uh, that faculty could do to really just start normalizing and opening up the door for these types of um, referrals for students is adding some type of uh, syllabus statement. So, um, you know, welcoming, welcoming a student into class. I just put a few examples here um, that we pulled to kind of um, give a heads up at the beginning of the class. You know, these are, um, these are the different places that you can get your support. And if you need it, um, kind of where the open doors are for people so that it's not down to the crisis. It's not down to now I failed and, and now I need to come, but you're, they're, being, you're, they're able to be more proactive um, about what they need. Um, so at the very least, <laughs> we're asking that maybe that's something that we could incorporate or have faculty incorporate into their syllabus um, at the beginning of a term um, other things that faculty might be able to do to start recognizing some of these needs would be to really take a look at what your costs of your course requirements are outside of tuition. Um, you know, are students being asked to travel to Denver? Are they being asked to take time off work to um, meet in group projects that are not designated in their in the set time of the syllabi? Um, all of these things can take away from their ability to work. Um, also, just um, looking at your office hours and making them flexible, especially for working parents. Um, and um, let's see here, I think I hit that one, but also just um, the other one that's maybe a little bit different would also be just the creating of those types of opportunities for students to start um, making a living wage. So how can we create those opportunities on campus for students um, to be able to meet those needs um, before it comes down to having to access maybe some other support services. So to bring us back around to the third prong of from that work that the Humboldt, that Humboldt State is doing, um, and this third prong is to address and combat institutional and systemic barriers to services and resources. Uh, up to this point, we've been offering the resources that respond to the issue, um, but we are admittedly not attacking the problem directly. Um, and what we're offering in are in large part Band-Aid fixes. We, um, to get to the root of the cause, we have to address the elephant in the room. And that is that higher education, the cost of higher education um, places students often in this situation. We recognize that we're doing a better and better job opening the doors, offering access to this type of education, um, but a Pell Grant or financial aid only gets you so far. And when basic needs are left unmet, we haven't really done our students the service that we intend to do. Um, and we are starting to face that. And um, this is a, a step in the right direction, but we, we admittedly need to attack the root causes a little more proactively. Um, we're starting to do a better job towards that end and it allows us to live out our, our um, our mission of access as a land grant institution. Um, the quote that I keep coming back to is one by Vincent Tin Vincent Tinto, and who recently stated, "Access without support is not true opportunity." So the support that we're we're trying to to mount up here is 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 the type of support that our students need. Um, but let's address also that root cause, and what that looks like is changing policy on how much funding goes towards this work. Um, Hunger Free Colorado is doing a little of that work who are, and we're partnering with them. There are so, uh, some other initiatives going towards policy change, but I think that's the work that's left in front of us. And it's something for us all to be aware of. Mike, one point here I, I like to just point out is that oftentimes when we think about our students transitioning to college, um, those more traditional college age students may have been receiving um, a free or reduced lunch program throughout their high school experiences and and then they transition to college and there's no equivalent program there's no um, sort of access point that gives them that support that they need so um, i feel like that's a part of that systemic barrier and something that we could we could approach something that we could look at
So as we wrap up our presentation today, we are really hopeful to get feedback. We are appreciative of the time that you took to watch this presentation, and we would love if you're willing um, to email me, and my email is here on the screen, lindsay.mason at callofstate.edu. We're really interested in at least two different areas of feedback. One, what questions do you still have at the end of this PowerPoint? What, what more do you wish we could cover during this presentation, or what do you believe would have um, a benefit um, to, our, to our campus colleagues, faculty and staff to include in this presentation? In addition, what, what are we missing and, and what more can we be doing it as a campus to address basic needs at, at the root cause, at a, as Mike mentioned, at a at kind of a Band-Aid level? What partners are we missing and or what, what are you hearing about happening on other campuses that's been really effective? We really want to do um, the, the most that we can on our campus to help our students be able to address their basic needs so that they can be academically successful. So if you're willing, we would love to hear your feedback, both about this presentation and about um, just the basic needs work that we're doing on campus in general. We also, again, just wanna say thank you um, for taking the time to watch this presentation. It means a lot to us. Um, and we are here if you have questions. We've got our names and emails up on here. Again, um, referring students to any one of us is the right place to go. We'll be able to get them connected to the resources. We're also here to answer questions if y'all have any, um, and again, to take feedback. So thanks again so much, y'all. Really appreciate your time and energy.